Friends, if you would, please open up your Bibles to Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. Joshua chapter 1, Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. I love the book of Joshua, and I love the first chapter in the book of Joshua. I love it. Have courage, have courage, have courage. I'm with you, I'm with you, I'm with you. Your ability to be able to tap into supernatural courage is your ability to be able to find the presence of God. If you don't get anything else out of, I say, out of anything I say today, if you could just learn this one thing, I have to get better and better and better at knowing where the presence of the Lord is within my life. Because if I can find the manifest presence of God, I can have courage to overcome anything. Amen? He says, this book of the law, this book of the Torah, this book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate it. You shall meditate in it day and night that you might observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. I want to read this one more time and I'm going to stop halfway through it. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. Isn't it amazing how the place of meditation is seen as your mouth? Like what's that all about? It's like looking at the Word of God like it's spiritual beef jerky. You chew on it and 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 chew on it. It's the understanding of, an, of a cow having a cud, right? Come on, you guys look at me like I'm a hillbilly now. This is a Word of God. <laughs> so this is what it is. It's like, okay, the everlasting gobstopper of the Word of God. And friends, I want to just tell you this. You can never stop looking into the Scriptures ever, ever. You can never stop being a Bible person ever. You can never stop going through the Scriptures. You can never stop being fascinated with the Scriptures. I was with a a world-famous man of God this this last week, and he told me that he reads from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22 every four months, and he has for over 20 years. He reads through the Bible every single verse three times a year. If I was to go through this room and say, Okay, how many of you guys have never read all the way through the Bible? There would be a huge showing of hands in here. And I want to just encourage you and just tell you this. It's time for you to read the Bible. It's time for you to know that the scriptures do testify of King Jesus. And you have to be, you cannot say that you are a prophetic person if you're not biblically prophetic. You cannot. And in this day of great deception, not only do you need to know what to think, but you need to know how to think. And the Word of God will show you that. If you want to have good success, if you want to make your way prosperous, then you're going to have to have this thing from your heart to your head, your head to your heart, your heart to your head, your head to your heart of the Word of God going on all the time. I'm going to start off here by giving you what the Word of God says about overcoming fear and overcoming anxiety. And I'm only going to give you seven verses. And you say, well, how many verses are there? There are at least 145 specific verses on how to deal with fear and anxiety. But there are over 360, possibly 365 verses that specifically say fear not. And there's somewhere around 400 to 430 verses depending upon which translation you go through, that deal with a narrative of fear, anxiety, worry, all that kind of, and all that sort of thing. Isaiah chapter 41, verse 10 is a good one. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right right hand. I will strengthen you and I will help you. If there is any scenario in your mind that you are fearful of that you're not going to make it, God says he will strengthen you. If there is any scenario in your mind that you're afraid that you're going to fall, God says I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. What he's saying is this, when he says do not fear, I am with you. So that's number one. Number one, be more aware of my presence than you are of your circumstances. Somebody say amen to that. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. Do not be freaked out in light of who I am to you. How can you be freaked out in light or through the lens of who God is to us? This is, this is the Word of God, guys. And I promise you, you didn't hear this in the media this week. Amen? So if your head was in the lap of Delilah all week, known as the false prophet of media, 
and whatever new Messiah that they are touting to us this week? Yeah, oh, come on. You do know that all prophets and all messiahs are not religious. You do know that, right? And Jesus said in the last days that many false prophets would rise up posting many false messiahs. We're living in that day today. And if your head has been in the lap of Delilah all week long, all you can ever hope to be is as Samson was after he put his head in the lap of Delilah and become a blind entertainer. Just grasping around for how you can entertain people or make them happy on your Facebook page. No, that's not you. Everybody say, that's not me. <laughs> Psalms 56 verse 3 says, when I am afraid, I put my trust in you. What is that? It's a predetermined response. Okay, am I going to be scared this week? I might be. You, you can't just say, I will never, ever, ever be scared. No, you're going to be scared sometimes. Like, not me. Okay, whatever. <laughs> Let me... Let me walk you around my ranch, and if you're not wearing snake boots and you come across some of them snakes I come across, it's a wonder I hadn't shot my own foot off because I pull out my pistol so fast and start blasting. <laughs> Serious, yeah, that's like a thing with me, like do not shoot your own foot. But dude, when you're, when you're nearly standing on a rattlesnake, <laughs> it'll make you hurt yourself, right? And did you get scared? Yes, I did get scared. But I have to have a predetermined response. It's like, I, I'm already determined if I come across a snake, I'm going to blast it. Okay, if I come across fear, I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. That's what I'm going to do. I was on an airplane yesterday coming back from Florida, and we had an, an issue with the plane for just a few minutes. Uh, it got my attention. I'm not going to go off into it. <laughs> You have to have some predetermined responses that come from the Word of God. The predetermined response of, if I get afraid this week, here's the deal. I'm going to go into a position of, I'm going to put my trust in the Lord. Somebody say amen to that. Amen. Philippians 4, 6, and 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer, by supplication, or the word petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests and make them known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in, in Christ Jesus. Guys, you got to know this word. You have to know the word of God. You, you can't get away from knowing the word. You cannot. So, what is this talking about? It's talking about this, talking to places that don't make sense. You're going to come across things that do not make sense. And let me tell you what, let me tell you how you guard your heart in the situations where you're like, okay, I don't know about that. I don't know. What, what guards your heart in the situations where you don't know about that? The peace of God. The peace of God, this kind of peace of God that guards your heart is not for the place where you've got it figured out. It's for the place where you don't have it figured out. It passes understanding. It's greater than understanding. It says, don't decide right now. I'm not going to be anxious or I'm not going to be full of anxiety over anything. I'm not going to be ruled by anxiety over anything. But this is what I'm going to do. By prayer and by petition with thanksgiving. I'm going to make my request, my request made known to God. You need to just know simply how to make your request made known to God to God. Father, I have a request for you. And just be real about it. Say, Lord, I don't have a clue about this, so this is what I'm praying for. I'm praying for stability. I'm praying, God, for simple solutions to complicated issues. I'm praying, God, that you guard me during this time of uncertainty and let me just be certain of you. And I pray, God, for an answer. I know, God, that your word says that when I seek you, I find you. When I ask, you answer. And when I knock, God, you always answer that door. You open that door. God, this is what I'm doing. Don't make it all complicated. Don't make it all religious. Sometimes you just need to go before the Lord, and sometimes you need to have a one-word a one prayer. Like, what are you talking about? Help! That's what I'm talking about. That's what I do. Yeah, it's, it, I, don't, I don't look cool at all when I pray. I don't look cool. I, 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 you know, yes, I pray the Word of God, and yes, I take my own battle cards. You guys know about my battle cards? I have scriptures and for every single theme that I can think of, and I take my battle card, my, my battle prayer uh, cards, and I go, and I start going through those scriptures and praying the Word of God, and then when I'm done with all that, I just say, oh God, please help me. Like, well, 
You can't come up with anything better than that? Well, I pray the word, I declare the word of God, and then I get real honest with God and say, okay, God, I did everything that you've equipped me to do. Now I, I'm in a place right here that I just don't know what to think about this, or I don't know how to do this, or I don't have words for this. I don't even have a right thought for that. I need the peace of God that passes all understanding. If I can stand in that place and be thankful with thanksgiving. Oh, that's a good word for somebody. Good word for Troy Brewer. John chapter 14, verse 27. Peace is what I leave with you, King Jesus says. It is my own peace that I give you. I do not give it as the world does. Do not be worried and upset. Do not be afraid. He says, look, I'm going to give you peace, but it's not the kind of peace that the world gives, and it's not the way that the world offers you peace. Well, anytime that the world offers you peace, it is always with another agenda to control you. It's exactly what Delilah offered Samson. Right? It's what the United Nations offers nations. We're peacekeepers. Oh, y'all didn't know that? Okay. We're peacekeepers. Yeah, they're not peacemakers. They're peacekeepers. Yeah. You want to know what a peacemaker is? Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, not the peacekeepers. You know what a peacemaker is? It's a pistol. That's what a peacemaker is. It's not a pacifist. Stand around and let a million people get hacked to death in Rwanda in the name of peace. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. 2 Timothy 1.7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Amen. Okay, so let's just talk about a spirit of fear here. Let's just kind of, again, I'm just bringing you the word of God because I know you hadn't heard it through the media this week. Amen. And I'm hoping to encourage you, get in your Bible and start meditating and chewing on the Word of God. Be convicted to be a greater Bible person. Because the world is telling you how to think, and it is not God. The world is telling you how to fear, and it is not God. The world has given you priorities that are not kingdom priorities. Whenever we see this spirit of fear, this is interesting. It's like, God didn't give you the spirit of fear. Can I, can I tell you what? Let me... Yes, okay, there is a demon, okay? Demons are also called spirits, right? Angels are also called spirits, we know that. But a spirit comes with a crowd. Like, what are you talking about? Let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you about the redeemed version of this. The spirit of prophecy. Like, what are you talking about the spirit of prophecy? We know that in the book of Revelation, guys, the Bible says that in the book of Revelation, the, it just spells it out and says, the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. That's a, that's, a, that's a strange thing to say, isn't it? I remember when I first came across this, I started asking everybody I knew, what does that mean? And they just quoted it back to me, which is what people do when they don't, when they want you to think they know what the Bible says and they don't know what it says, they just learn the words. And I don't like that. Amen. So what does it mean that the, that the, 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 the testimony of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy? Well, my God, son, it meaneth this. The testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Well, that's not helpful. What does that actually mean? All right, well, for, for one thing, let's just talk about what the testimony of Jesus is. We've even messed that up among us that, that you know, it, there was such a great move of God that happened in the 1970s, and I'm so grateful for the Jesus movement that happened. I'm talking about next level move of God, and guys, we need the next level version of that. Right on? But one of the things that blew people's minds, and you need to know, there was no Jesus movement without the manifest power of Jesus. It was a Holy Ghost movement. It truly was a Holy Ghost movement. And a big, huge part of it was deliverance. People were delivered of so many things. At the same exact time that the drug culture was taken over the world and the whole sexual culture was taken over the world, people found the mind of Jesus and they also found intimacy in Christ. At the same exact time. Why? Because where sin abounds, grace does much more abound. Amen. And it was a great move of God. But one of the casualties of that just came the understanding as people stood up and said, hey, you know what, I was delivered of this and I was delivered of that and I was this and I was that. As we became accustomed to, to an understanding that that's what our testimony is. Our testimony is not what we did before we were saved. Our testimony is who Jesus is to us. What we did before we, we were saved is our history. Amen. But who Jesus is to us is our testimony. 
So if you're going to ask me, oh, okay, so it has to do with my history in Christ is my testimony. And again, I'm not, I don't mean to dog anybody from the 70s of that movie because it's so precious and it's so good. I'm just trying to give another layer to that. And it, and it works like this. Troy, who is Jesus to you? He's my sanity. He's my stability. He is my provider in every single way. How do you know? Because of this testimony of how he showed up, that testimony of how he showed up, this testimony of how he showed up. He is my healer. Amen. He, he's my vindicator. Amen, amen, amen. Uh, he is, he's the song that I wake to, that I wake up to. Sometimes I wake up to Tom Petty, but most times I wake up to a hymn. <laughs> but even some Tom Petty is, I won't back down, stand me up against the gates of hell, but I won't back down. Like sometimes I wake up singing that song, like, okay, it's the day I got to fight. <laughs> right, you're confused. No, no, I'm not. I'm not. It's all kingdom. Amen. I'm looking for Jesus. I love me some Jesus, I promise you. So in the midst of all this, it's my testimony, like somebody, somebody give me one word for who Jesus is to you. Healer. Redeemer. Come on, keep on going. Keep going. Let me hear it. There you go. Can you continue to do that? Come on, do it. Okay, let me just tell you this right now. In the midst of this, a spirit of prophecy begins to move. A spirit of prophecy is not if you're in the office of a prophet or if you have the gift of prophecy. The spirit of prophecy is when the spirit of the Lord begins to move in such a way that we can prophesy and it happens in the testimony of Jesus. Brother Saul, who is one of the greatest biblical knuckleheads that there is, there's really not much of a greater example of a knucklehead in the Bible who was anointed than Saul. And he went to go kill the prophets, got among the prophets and started to prophesy. So if you want to prophesy, you need to move among prophetic people. Amen. And a spirit of prophecy begins to move with that. Okay, exactly like that. If you're not moving in your connections with kingdom people, you're moving in a mob of the world. And I want to tell you what is in the mob of the world, a spirit of fear. You learn how to be fearful. You learn how to not trust. You learn how to be sexual. You learn how to throw your life away. You learn how to freak out. You learn all those things by moving the way that the world moves. So God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and a sound mind. Mm. 1 John 4, 18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out all fear. Because fear has to do with punishment, and the one who fears is not made perfect in love. Let me tell you how you get rid of fear. You replace it with the love of God. Hallelujah. Psalms 94, when anxiety was great within me, your consolation brought joy to my soul. There have been times, guys, I want to tell you right now that I went before the Lord and said, okay, God, I need to just be totally honest with you and just tell you I am really fighting anxiety today. And dude, I don't have to hide that from the Lord. It's not like he doesn't know. He wants to know if I can be intimate with him in the, mess, in, in the midst of that mess. Do I trust him with that? Or do I believe he's going to rebuke me and say, get away from me and come back, boy, whenever, whenever you got your act together? No, that's not what he does. And again, sometimes I have one word prayer, and it's just help. Sometimes I walk around and I pray in the Holy Spirit or I, I sing in the Spirit, and I do that. If I don't know what to pray, yes, I do know the Word, and I do love the Word when it comes to subjects, and I love themes of the Word of God, and I love that. But I also, too, sometimes, man, I just come before the Lord and say, Lord, I'm, I'm really fighting anxiety today, and I know that that's not you. Help me. Fill me up. And I've had the Lord show up and just love on me and say, Troy, it's not going to be that way. Troy, it's not as big a deal as you think it is. Troy, you need to check that out and see if that's actually true. Troy, you need to go talk to those people. Troy, you never need to answer those haters. Do not worry about that guy. Do not, I, don't worry about that guy. Hey, Troy, that's, it, I've had the consolation of the Lord show up within my life. Aren't you grateful for that? But a lot of times, man, we just can't be honest enough to come before the Lord and say, God, please help me. I'm whack. I've recognized through the Spirit of the Lord, uh, I'm crazy. Can, can you do anything with this? And the Lord's like, I love your mess. I love it. I think it's hilarious. See, 
When you really love somebody that is screwed up, you think they're funny. <laughs> Am I telling the truth or what? I am telling the truth. So I think that God thinks I'm hilarious. That's what I think. Now, I, I can tell you that uh, we have trouble being honest with the Lord because we think we have these religious games to, to play. And guys, you don't have time for that anymore. Now, if you, were, if you were a part of the media this last week, and if you were like watching the news all week long, and you were into all the news all week long, you didn't hear any of this, and you haven't been thinking this way. Friends, there needs to be a revival of the Word of God within the churches of America. And we should be convicted and passionate, yes, about the presence of Jesus, yes, about the power of the Holy, yes, about the power of the Holy Spirit, but not at the expense of knowing the Word of God. We have to be biblically based people. Well, this last week, if your head was in the world and was not in the Word, you probably need major consolation. In Canada, they are burning down churches left and right, and the government goes, oh. Don't care. Don't care how many lives it destroys. Glad to get rid of the church. And if, if you do not think that socialists will destroy the church any chance they get, you do not understand socialism. They do it every single time. Every time. Like, well, these socialists will be different than these other socialists. No. No, they are dependent upon knuckleheads like that to vote for them. And I want to encourage you, man, know the spirit of truth. Know what's real. Know what's life. Know what's death. And call life, life, and call death, death. Amen. It all started, you know, last, last week was the 4th of July, and I preached, a, I preached a message on Independence Day, and then I went home, and and I was going through my Twitter feed, and I saw Franklin Graham came out with this big thing, said, please pray for Hobby Lobby. They are under such huge attack. Well, why would Hobby Lobby be under attack this week? Why would that possibly happen? I mean, what horrible thing did they do publicly that the world says, that's the last straw? In the United States of America, we do not do that. I don't know who you think you are. They printed this. I want to show you what it is. That's what they printed. And put that in newspapers. Blessed is a nation whose God is the Lord. And the backlash that it caused, the backlash, guys, was unbelievable. I'm going to read to you from Newsweek magazine. It has no credibility whatsoever. Newsweek magazine, the one that came out with Madam President with Hillary on it, right? So let me show you, let me show you what Newsweek magazine came out and said this week. Talking about with these, with these damning words. Here we go. Are you ready? Arts and crafts giant Hobby Lobby faced a giant backlash after it ran a full-page advertisement on July the 4th in several newspapers across the United States that appeared to call for a Christian-ran government. <laughs> the ad, which Hobby Lobby ran in newspapers on Independence Day, was titled, One Nation Under God. Really, they're using these words as if these are horrible, hateful words. Like, you need to know the blasphemy that these guys are saying. They're saying one nation under God. We got to shut them down. We got to shut them down. Now, here's what's amazing. In other nothing to see here news, the San Francisco Gay Men's Choir came out with a declaration that those men were coming after our children in our homes. And you know what? The world applauded that. It's beautiful, and it's art, and it's so funny. I just think it's so beautiful. I, I think it's wonderful. And they're like, we're coming after your children. We're talking about grown men, grown homosexual men looking into a camera. At one point, over 100 men looking into a camera saying, we're coming for your children. We're coming for your children. The same week, you have this tremendous backlash against the audacity of somebody saying one nation under God, and that is considered hate speech, while a hundred homosexual men screaming, we're coming after your children, is considered beautiful. That's the day that you're living in today. And I want to just tell you this, you need to know this, if all you listen to is media, you'll get caught up in that. 
And if all your kids do is have screen time, screen time, screen time, they will get caught up in that. You have to have the Word of God. You have to know the Word of God. You have to meditate on the Word of God. You can't get away from the Word of God. Well, seems like, man, the world has gone crazy. The world has gone crazy. Do you know what happened? You know what happened on the stage of American media this week? Both the government on the East Coast and the, and the homosexuals on the West Coast said, we're coming to your house door to door. Did you catch that? And if you think they have any other agenda than that, you're crazy. Oh, they don't mean it. No, they mean it. And they've always meant it. Now, at the same exact time, this is, this is what happened. It's like this. In the day that King Jesus was crucified, they put Jesus up and they called him a hater and a murderer. Then they brought a hater and a murderer called Barabbas up and they called him beautiful. And they chose Barabbas over King Jesus. Well, you saw that play before your eyes this week. This week, you saw that. Now, here's what I want to tell you. I'm just going to just tell you that when it comes to all these things that are taking place in our nation right now and the unraveling of everything that we know as a society, I can tell you this, that if you do not know the Word of God and if you do not know the presence of God, you will not make it. And I challenge you to be a drop dead, sewed out Jesus freak. I challenge you to not be afraid. I challenge you to be full of the Word of God. I challenge you, listen, if, if, if every night for you is wine, cheese, and Netflix, you need to change that. You don't live in a day where you can do that. I, like, I'm, listen, I'm not a raging Pentecostal that doesn't have a TV. I've got a TV. I've got a computer. I, I love movies. I, I, I love watching stuff. But I want to tell you, you've got to be vigilant today. And you're going to have to be committed. You're going to have to be radically committed today in a way like, like what you haven't had to be in the past. Friends, the categories of Messiah and prophet are not just religious. A false Messiah is a leader who rises up and promises that I am the answer and the answer is here when it's not the answer. He or she is a face of a movement that deceives you any way from truth into something demonic and false. A false prophet is somebody who projects the future or trends that point to or validate the false Messiah that they are putting up. Jesus said the last day would be full of false prophets and false messiahs. You are living in it, and guys, it is the media. They're like, it can't be because it entertains me too much. <sighs> guys, <laughs> you know, the Lord is really, really increasing the impact that we're making as a church, and everybody is telling me, you need to back off. You need to play it safe. You need to quit preaching such stuff. Why don't you just... Why don't you just preach on numbers, and that's what everybody loves you for, and why don't you just get up there? Why do you got to actually say anything about the things that are going on in society? Because I actually love people is why, and because I actually want to help people, and because I actually want to answer evil with the goodness of God. And man, listen, you can do this. You can beat this. Jesus is the answer. Your home does not have to be wasted by the world. Your marriage does not have to be wasted by the world. Your body does not have to be addicted. You do not have to be crazy. You do not have to be fearful. Jesus is real and he is alive. He is so real and he's so alive and he loves you so much. Listen, I know it's a difficult day and I'm sorry. And I also want to just say this too. I, if, 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 if you're like, well, man, I wish you wouldn't say anything politically. I'm not talking politics. I'm talking kingdom. And because politics is in our lane, it ends up being political. And you need to know that. I have no agenda to go after anybody, anybody's politics or anything like that. But know this, man. If you're voting for socialism and you're promoting socialism, you're the enemy of freedom. And, and if, you're, if you're voting for and promoting this mess that these maniacs are singing about in San Francisco and saying, it's okay for them to come after my kids? No, it's not okay for them to come after my kids, no. But know this too, it really causes me to say, are we awake to the day that we live in and are we teaching our children the Word of God? 
Are we making sure that our kids are in camps this year? Are we making sure that they're around godly people? Are we using our community in such a way that we're building each other up and causing iron to sharpen iron? Are we helping each other and blessing each other? Or are we picking each other apart with the things that we don't agree with? Because I ain't got time for that. I got no time for that whatsoever. There ain't a single one of you that's ever got a phone call from me going, you know, I really don't like this about your life. I don't like that. I ain't got time for that. I'm busy. And if you got time for that, and if you spend all of your internet time and all of your Facebook time hating on me or any other man of God, it's because, it's because you are too limp-wristed to have your own ministry. And your ministry is to pick on the rest of us. Because you're not brave enough or smart enough or courageous enough or anointed enough to do the thing that God told you to do. So all you do is criticize anybody else that is actually doing something. Well, I refuse to be afraid of those people. They're cowards. Why would I be afraid of a coward? I'm not going to be afraid of those people. And guys, if I've come across as anything other than just... I want to be so pure in how, in how I bring this, and I know it's going to bring a big backlash because every, every leftist in the world demands that you and I should be quiet today. Here's what I say, no, no, we will not be quiet, no, we will not. And I, I'm not just trying to just stir up trouble, I'm trying to stir up the people of Jesus to be madly in love with Jesus. Friends, if you hadn't gotten to the Word of God in a long, long time, get in the Word. If your prayer life is not what it should be, let it be. If you're not committed in the body of Christ to, like what you should be, get committed. If you have been the kind of person that would walk past the blind lady on the street and not, not hear her story or not recognize that, man, that's the voice of the Lord coming out of that woman's mouth. You can be that person. If if you're so full of the media, can I just tell you this? It didn't take me five minutes to come up with all the headlines that I came up with today. I don't have to be in the media 24 hours a day. You know, I didn't say nothing about the pestilence of grasshoppers that's happening right now across the United States that's eating all of our crops. Like, what are you talking about? I'm talking about the government came out with a statistic this week that said in Montana, there are 15 grasshoppers per square yard. Or the big snake invasion that's happening in California right now with the heat that just happened. It was 118 degrees in Washington last week. 118 degrees? 118 in Washington state? Yes, sir. Are you kidding me? That the world is literally on fire? The world is locked up? Yes. People are sick and dying and everybody's worried about getting along with what entertains them? Really? Friends, we need each other and we need Jesus more now than ever, ever, ever before. Hallelujah. So I'm going to pray this prayer over you. Receive this prayer. I declare in the name of King Jesus that you will endure to the end. Father, I call these people, every single person, God, that's watching an overcomer. I declare, God, that where sin does abound, God, grace does much more abound. Simple solutions to complicated issues and God-given ability to be able to think clearly and purely. I declare a greater increase of His glory, His presence, His power, angelic assignment for the performance of His Word upon your life. May revelation knowledge be increased in your life. May you be a fearless demonstration of freedom, redemption, and the goodness of God. May the fruit of the Holy Spirit be increased in your life love and joy and peace and long-suffering and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. I declare you will not live a powerless life in the name of King Jesus. May the favor of the Lord be upon you everywhere you go, and may your children and your children's children be favored, and may you be at the right place at the right time for the right kind of miracle to happen. I declare Psalms 91, hedge of protection around you and your house. Supernatural increase in wisdom for finances and a Deuteronomy 8.18 blessing of the power to gain wealth belongs to you in Jesus' name. I call your home the habitation of peace and joy, the habitation of the Holy Ghost. May your nights be full of dreams and visions and encounters with God. 
Wisdom and revelation and knowledge and discernment and understanding belong to you in the name of King Jesus. Any form of depression, I say go in Jesus' name. Go, you spirit of depression. I rebuke you in the mighty name of King Jesus. Alignment for assignment and destiny and legacy are yours. Abundance of mercy and justice. May crooked paths be made straight for you in the name of King Jesus. May you hear God speak, understand His Word, find Him when you seek Him, have Him answer when you ask, experience an open door whenever you knock, live in the reality that His kingdom is coming, and see the goodness of God in the land of the living. I declare that over your life. The Father, release your angels for the performance of your Word. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, let's give the Lord a great big praise. So good. Hallelujah.